Hello there, welcome to the Potter's Wheel. I'm George Osmus, I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Fire is one of those things that can either be tremendously beneficial or horrifically destructive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a fire in a fireplace can bring light, warmth, and a cozy atmosphere to your home, but if it escapes the fireplace, it can burn your whole house down. In both the Old and New Testaments, the Bible declares that God is a consuming fire. The disciple of Jesus needs this fire burning brightly on the altar of his heart if he is to fulfill the call of God on his life. And we'll talk about that fire on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. The benefits of having the fire of God in your life are many. It lights our way in this sin-darkened world. It keeps our love for God and for people from growing cold. And it provides a defense against the attacks of the enemy. To help illustrate the point, we're going to take a look at a scene from one of the most exciting adventure films of the early 80s, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The movie was written by Lawrence Kasdan, based on a story by George Lucas and Philip Kaufman. It was directed by Steven Spielberg and stars Harrison Ford, Karen Allen, and Paul Freeman. After locating the Lost Ark of the Covenant, intrepid archaeologist and adventurer Indiana Jones and his partner Marion Ravenwood have been trapped in the Well of Souls by Jones's rival, the wicked Brene Belloc. Their only protection against the thousands of poisonous snakes that fill the well are a few torches. Let's see how they get out of this one. I'm afraid we must be going now, Dr. Jones. Our prize is awaited in Berlin. But I do not wish to leave you down in that awful place, all alone. Fredo, oh, oh! oh! you get your hands off of me! Oh! Where are you going? Through that 
wall. Just get ready to run. Whatever happens to me. What do you mean by that? I think Indy and Marion have a new appreciation of the scripture that says God will make the way of escape in our times of trial and testing and temptation. Don't you agree? Let's talk about the prophetic interpretation of the clip. The well of souls represents the natural world we live in. It's irredeemably broken by the fall of man, full of all kinds of deadly peril. It is, as I've said in almost every episode, under the sway of the wicked one. The snakes represent the demonic entities sent by hell to steal, kill, and destroy. The torches represent the fire of God that provides our only true light in the darkness and keeps the demons at bay. You saw how terrified Marion was at the prospect of the last torch going out. She knows what will happen to her when it does. Those snakes will strike and their poisonous bites will kill her in minutes. She's fully aware of the danger she is in and that the torch is not only her only light, but her only defense against the deadly enemies that surround her. Would to God that the Church of Jesus Christ was as aware of the danger she is in in this hour. When I first came to Jesus in 1996, probably the first really big surprise beyond the revelation of his love for me was that God manifests himself by fire. In my religious mindset, I had always associated fire only with the devil. Even as an unbeliever, I was aware that hell was a place of eternal fire and torment. So I was pretty shocked and amazed to find that God often reveals himself through fire. Here are a few examples. Going all the way back to the beginning, after man was driven out of the garden, the Bible says God placed a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God called Moses out of a burning bush and led Israel through the wilderness with a pillar of fire. God kindled the fire on the altar of the wilderness tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem and charged the priests to keep it burning at all times. Something for you to chew on as we continue today. Doesn't the Bible say Jesus has made us kings and priests to our God? Hmm. That's all Old Testament, you say. Well, he told the prophet Malachi, for I am the Lord, I do not change. So his character then is still his character now. But fear not, there are New Testament examples as well. John the Baptist said of Jesus, He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus himself said, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. He kindled that fire in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and divided tongues as of fire came on all the disciples. The two disciples to whom he ministered on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection later testified, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? The fire of God figures in our future as well as Paul teaches that our works will be tried by fire on the day of the Lord. Whoever's work endures the fire will receive a reward 
but he whose work is consumed will suffer loss, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I think it's a mistake to get too dogmatic about some things in the kingdom, and the fire of God would be one of those things. We see through a glass darkly, and we know only in part in this world. But God has given us his word, which makes his will, his ways, and his principles known. He has also given us his spirit to lead and guide us into all truth, so we're not completely on our own. Jeremiah said, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. God later confirmed the word, asking Jeremiah, Is not my word like a fire? The psalmist declared the word of the Lord to be a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. This is a poetic way of saying that the Bible defines the moral code of the believer. It informs and illuminates our understanding of the world around us, both the natural world, which we can see and touch and handle, and the spirit world, which is unseen. If the Bible, the written word of God, is light, then to reject it is to choose to walk in darkness, and walking in darkness will keep you from knowing what makes you stumble. I can also say from my own experience that the fire of God can be a renewed zeal and passion for the things of God. When the Spirit of God is moving, there is always a fresh outpouring of a strong desire to see His kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost come and His will to be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Isaiah, speaking of the coming kingdom of the Messiah, said, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's the zeal of God that motivates prayer. It's the zeal of God that motivates good works. It's the zeal of God that motivates praise and worship. It's the zeal of God that motivates obedience to God's commandments. It's the zeal of God that moves us out into new areas of ministry. It's the zeal of God that helps us share the gospel and fuels a desire to see the lost be born again and become children of God. I've experienced this zeal. I've experienced the, this move of the Holy Spirit of God, and I testify to you that it is like a consuming fire. It consumes all of the chaff in my soul, the pride, the complacency, the apathy, and all the other mental and emotional baggage that hinders my walk with God. Jesus warned that in the last days, because iniquity would abound, the love of many would grow cold. People who have the fire of God burning in their hearts don't have to worry about this. The fire of God keeps them on the path of righteousness, making godly choices for their lives. The fire of God keeps them compassionate and tender-hearted toward their fellow man. The fire of God keeps them in unceasing prayer. The fire of God keeps them in praise and worship. The fire of God keeps them living to please God instead of self. I bear witness that his words are true. With all the garbage going on in the world, if I spend too much time looking at the wickedness of man, I can feel my own love for God and for my neighbor waning. Fortunately, I know what to do when I start feeling like that. The Lord has taught me that I don't have to give in to that. I don't have to be ruled by my feelings and my perceptions. Those things are not my God, Jesus is. Because He is my God, I can cry out to Him for a fresh dose of the ghost, hallelujah. And because He knows how to give good gifts to His children, He'll give me fresh fire for my vessel. Fire that will burn the unholy trinity, doubt, fear, and unbelief out of my soul and replace it with the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. In the Old Testament, there was always a fire on the altar of the temple to consume the sacrifice. In the New Testament, we need to remember that we are the sacrifice, a living sacrifice, and the fire of God is a refiner's fire that burns up all the impurities. We need to stay on the altar and let the fire of God burn up the bad attitudes, the selfish motives, the pet sins, and all the other carnal and demonic impulses that keep us from pursuing and fulfilling the call of God on our lives. Here's the thing, saints. I don't believe this is a one and done deal. We live in a fallen world that's always trying to pull us back into darkness. Our soul is constantly bombarded with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
We need to continually return to the altar to have it burned out of us so that we can go out and do the will of God. Hopefully by now you see clearly the need for a holy fire of God to be burning in your life. If you have it, great. Pray for your neighbors to get it. If you don't have it or if it's burning a little low these days, we'll talk about how to get it and how to maintain it after these words from Potter's Wheel Films. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you suppose a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Wheel Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies and TV shows that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, teach biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with their digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to use our tools and talent to help you expand your audience and increase your impact in the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Potter's Wheel Films is proud to announce that our SC shop is now open for business. We're offering an ever-increasing line of Potter's Wheel Films merchandise and a gospel-centered clothing line. Proceeds from the sales will go toward funding current and future projects for Potter's Wheel Films. I believe God has some big plans for Potter's Wheel Films in the days to come. You can be part of it by shopping our store at Etsy.com. Also, don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube so you don't miss out on any of the excitement as we step out into the future God has for us. God bless. Welcome back. One of the drawbacks to life in this fallen world is that no condition remains static. Things change constantly. And what seems rock solid one day can crumble like a sandcastle at high tide on the next. In this regard, life in the Spirit is no different. Paul encouraged the Ephesians to be filled with the Spirit, which experience has taught me is not a one and done proposition. I don't want to split a bunch of theological hairs here, but I don't believe that being filled with the Spirit is the same thing as being baptized in the Spirit or the indwelling of the Spirit. Many who have studied the original Greek in this verse claim it can be legitimately translate, translated as be being filled. I'm not fluent in ancient Greek, so I can neither confirm nor deny on the basis of language, but I can confirm that there are times and seasons when the Spirit is stronger in me than it is at others. From that perspective and from the perspective of doing the work God has called me to do, I have to come to understand that spirit life is a never-ending cycle of being filled, being poured out, and being filled again. Why am I talking about being filled with the Spirit? Because I believe being filled with the Spirit is one manifestation of the fire of God. Is it the only one? No, probably not. But in my experience, the two are intimately entwined together. It's hard for me to imagine how you can have one without the other. We established in the first part of the show how important the fire of God is for the disciple of Christ. If you're in a season of your life where you are fully on fire for God, hallelujah. You're in a position to pray and impart that fire to others by the Spirit. But you still want to pay attention to what I'm going to say next because someday it'll be your turn to be on the receiving end. You will need to know how to rekindle your fire when the trials and tribulations of life start to put it out. If you're in a season where the fire is waning or maybe you've never experienced the fire of God like I'm talking about, I want to share some wisdom on how to get it. Are these the only ways to catch the fire of God? No, probably not. But these principles have worked for me in the past and because God is not a respecter of persons, I believe they will help you as well if you are a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. The first and most obvious way to get the fire of God or to be filled with the Spirit, if you prefer thinking of it that way, is to ask for it. Jesus said, 
So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Of course, it goes without saying that our asking, seeking, and knocking must be done in faith. We're not going to get very far with God if we ask without believing we will receive, seek without believing we will find, or knock without believing it will be opened. Without faith, the writer of Hebrews declared, it is impossible to please God. We need to get into faith to do this kind of asking because faith gets us out of our carnal mind and into the spirit. Paul said in Romans 8, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If we're going to receive the fire of God, it's not going to come through our carnal mind. Much as it pains me to say it, fasting is another means we can employ. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Genuine fasting weakens the flesh nature, and as God told Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I know fasting isn't on anybody's short list of things we love to do, but I really believe it is a necessity for growth and maturity in the life of a disciple. We all, myself included, need to be prayerful and mindful of any fasting the Lord would call us to and cooperate fully in it when that call comes. Mark my words, cooperation with the Spirit is always better than rebellion. Don't ask me how I know. Another way to get your fire lit is through praise and worship. Psalm 22 says in some translations that God inhabits the praises of Israel. And Israel here refers to His covenant people. And if you need to know who that is in our modern times, well, that's the church of Jesus Christ. We who have called on the name of the Lord believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead on the third day. We who have been born again and have the spirit of the living God on the inside of us. We who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and are declared righteous in the sight of God. We are the covenant people of God today. What He promised to Israel in the Old Testament is ours in the New. As it is written, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Do you want to be in the presence of God? Get some praise and worship going in your life. Now that can mean music, but not always. More important than the music is the attitude of the heart. Meditate on His faithfulness, on the trials He's already brought you through, on what He accomplished for you at the cross, on His goodness and majesty and the glory of creation. By all means, if the Spirit moves you to sing, then sing to the glory of God with all your heart. If the Spirit moves you to shout, then shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. If the Spirit moves you to dance, then make like Kevin Bacon in Footloose. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, and you will find that He is not slack concerning His promise. He will inhabit your praises, and you will experience His presence. We talked earlier about how the Word of God is a fire, so it follows that reading the Bible and applying its principles to your life will also get the fire of God operating in your life. Begin to order your conduct according to the principles and the moral law of God and see if He doesn't pour His Spirit, His fire, into your life. It won't be long before you find His Word burning up the works of hell and setting your soul free to worship and serve God with your whole heart. Finally, get yourself into a Spirit-filled church and have the elders lay hands on you. That's how young Pastor Timothy got the fire of God kindled in his life, according to Paul. If you have vessels willing to impart the fire and vessels willing to receive it, I see no reason not to believe that the fire cannot be transferred by the laying on of hands. I know some folk have put this into the not for today category, but I really have to ask you, if the Bible is our instruction manual for life, why does it include instructions to do things God doesn't want us to do today? Why does it say to lay hands on the sick if He doesn't want to heal today? Why does it say to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit if He's not still pouring it out today? 
Who benefits if we believe that the supernatural power of God is not for today? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness? I think we know the answer to that. Let's close in prayer. Holy God, we come before your throne today to worship you and to honor you and to thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing and all that you have promised. Uh, for we know that you are faithful to watch over your word to perform it. You are able, well able, to fulfill all that you have promised, and we receive it all by faith. I pray, Lord, for, those, for all those watching and for myself, that we would each one receive fresh fire in our vessels, that we would have a new zeal for your word, a new zeal for your kingdom, a new passion for the lost, a new desire for holiness and righteousness. Father God, let your fire be kindled afresh and anew on the altar of our hearts. Consume the sacrifice, O Lord, and burn up the chaff, the doubt, fear, and unbelief, the depression, the anger, the offenses, all the stuff that hinders your work in us and through us. Burn up, O God, the apathy, the complacency, the greed, the selfishness, the carnality that has us serving ourselves instead of serving you. Let your fire be the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. Let your fire show us the path of righteousness that you have called us to walk for your name's sake. Let the zeal of the Lord of hosts accomplish the establishing and ordering of your kingdom in our lives. In Jesus' name, God bless. All your life, there has been a God in heaven who loves you and wants an intimate, personal relationship with you. Sin made that impossible, but he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to remove that barrier and offer eternal life to whosoever will believe on his name. If you've never done so before, I encourage you to say yes to God today. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Commit to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. Now, tell someone about your decision because the Bible says, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you did that from a sincere heart, welcome to the family of God. You have taken the first step of a journey that you will be on for the rest of your life. You are now born again, a new creation in the eyes of your heavenly Father. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Call this station to talk about the next steps. God bless, brother. Thank you.